great piece in New York Magazine by David, wait, Benjamin, Benjamin Wallace. Okay, he's got a hyphenated last name. David Wallace Wells, that's his name. How the West lost COVID. How did so many rich countries get it so wrong? And how did others get it so right? And David Wallace also has a terrific Twitter thread on this. If you wanted to explain the devastating American pandemic through American policy failures, the evidence would seem to be there that the failures looking obvious to anyone. So why did so many of the countries of Europe and indeed throughout the Americas fail at roughly the same scale? What does it say about the obvious American errors that they were reproduced in most of the places the country considered as peers? From a global perspective, one year later in, two very large facts about the course of the pandemic loom above all others. First, the policy levers Americans have obsessed over all year, mask wearing, social distancing, lockdowns, can not be the sole drivers of transmission, given that states taking very different measures, California and Florida most famously, performed quite similarly. And given how countries that were very strict, Peru or Italy, did not reliably outperform those places which took much looser measures, Japan and, say, Sweden. As a group, the nations of the world, once often grouped as the West, Europe and the Americas, had a categorically more catastrophic experience than anyone else. The United States had many reasons to expect to outperform peer countries like Germany, United Kingdom, or the Netherlands, larger state and medical capacity, for instance, though there are also reasons containing a pandemic here might have been more difficult, a large and diverse country full of comorbidities. Most, about 70% of Americans are overweight. America's at the center of global commerce, but as awful as the American experience seems to Americans, Compared to the rest of Europe and the Americans, Americas, it was, by the crude metric of deaths per million citizens, about average, not at all exceptional. And yet, in nearly every forensic account of the American pandemic published in recent months, the country's poor performance was explained almost entirely with reference to American policy choices, with hardly any acknowledgement of the global context of Western failure. So the New York Times published a long piece, How the United States Guaranteed Its Own Failure. One year, 400,000 coronavirus deaths. How the U.S. Guaranteed Its Own Failure. And then in the same New York Times piece, a retrospective on how the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, did. The CDC waited its entire existence for this moment. What went wrong? The technology was old, the data poor, the bureaucracy slow the guidance confusing, the administration not in agreement. And all these journos have been writing about the unique U.S. failure to control the virus, but there was nothing unique about America and the COVID virus. The Washington Post was similarly blinkered. They published an article, the CDC's failed race against COVID-19, a threat underestimated. So... There's no context to all these news reports about how, how America was just so uniquely horrible in responding to COVID-19. Let me play a little bit here from Christopher Cordwell. I, you know, I, I would say, in the simplest sense, the book doesn't really have a thesis. It's a narrative. It's basically the story of the country um, from the assassination of Kennedy to the election of Trump. Um, and it talks about a lot of elements of things that have changed in the country, the, you know, the role of the Vietnam War, the, the role of feminism, that kind of thing. But there is one, um, let's say, theory that, I, that runs through the book, and I would say is at the heart of the book, um, which is that a lot of the politics of today has to do with some elements of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that, that perhaps people didn't see or that perhaps have changed over time. Um, I think it's fair to say that there were, there were for all the good that that uh, act did, and for all the um, admirable motivations that it had, it has evolved in ways that have caused great problems for the country. Um, basically, in 1964, uh, the country was confronted with what it thought was kind of a local problem, that is segregation in the deepest part of the Deep South. Outside of the South, and um, 
this is something that that I think that uh, opinion polls from the time show quite clearly. Most Americans did not feel that the issue of racism and segregation really concerned them at all. They almost looked at the South as kind of a foreign policy problem. Um, in the border South, there was segregation. There was also progress. I think that people were looking primarily at Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, um, and seeing horrible scenes of um, you know of people having fire hoses and and and, and dogs turned on them at at um, at, uh, at demonstrations, and they wanted it to stop. And I think that there was a big there was a consensus in the country, particularly after Kennedy died, and particularly after Lyndon Johnson portrayed uh, civil rights as as John F. Kennedy's noblest aspiration. There was a, a consensus in the country to do this. Um, but it was a tricky thing to do. I mean, one of the things I say in the book is that this has always been considered a problem in the United States. There has never been a year of American history in which the race problem has not been considered a problem. The reason that nothing had been done about it um, until 1964 is that it was a very difficult thing to do. Um, and it was a it was a difficult thing to do um, in large part because the South was a democracy. Now, nowadays you'd say, well, some democracy where you know people have to fill out a literacy test to to, to vote, or you know, you can say that it was you can you can call it a bad democracy, you can call it a sham democracy, but it was a democracy. And in order to undo um, uh, the laws of, of 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 Jim Crow, it meant overturning a democracy. Now, if there were a way to limit that overturning of democracy to sort of Alabama and Mississippi, we would not be having this conversation today. All right, David Wallace writes in New York Magazine. This is just a, a terrific overview how the West lost COVID. And essentially, it boils down to the virus is the virus. The virus has its own logic and its own trajectory. Now, in the United States over the past year, the story of our struggle with COVID has been dominated by the character of Donald Trump, who supposedly presided over it so ineptly often with such indifference, it seemed he was rooting for the disease. But the problem with assigning Donald Trump all or even most of the blame for America's suffering is that America's failure is not unique. Before the arrival of vaccines, the American experience of the coronavirus was not exceptional. It was typical among European nations. So... Use the metric of deaths per capita. The United States suffered less than the United Kingdom, less than Portugal, less than the Czech Republic, about the same rate as Italy, Spain, and France. South America, just below these countries. Now, none of these countries, save Brazil, had presidents or prime ministers who so callously downplayed the threat of the disease as Trump, or who tried to suppress testing, or held indoor political rallies during a local surge. But uh, there's not much evidence or reason to believe that if someone else was president, we would have had a different experience. There are only so many tools at our disposal. It's not obvious that different measures taken in different places clearly led to different outcomes. It, it's simplistic to say, oh, these countries, they controlled the virus, they eliminated the virus, and they just did things extremely differently. The interventions that took place in countries like New Zealand and Australia, they weren't drastically different in stringency or in duration from what the United States and European nations did. The country that had the strictest lockdown for the longest in the world is Peru. Peru was absolutely devastated by COVID. There's not a set of policies that just bring success dealing with COVID and can be just applied to any place in the world. Now, for American liberals, they see COVID as a straightforward management challenge in which the pandemic can be solved through science first policy and dutiful compliance, right? Liberals look at COVID as a morality play. So you've got social distancing and masking. These are tests of personal and executive virtue and these things determine the course of the disease, but that's nonsense. So if you read the national press from any first world industrialized country, be it Germany, Switzerland, or France, it's always about, oh, you know, why did our nation state do so terribly? It's, it's, this is a reflection of national narcissism. So the United Kingdom, United States, France, Germany, they frame everything in terms of narratives of national crisis. The highest per capita death rate in the United States was not found in Texas or in Florida or in some red state. It was found in New Jersey. 
During the devastating fall surge of COVID, a poll found 90% of Americans were wearing a mask. Close contacts in states with heavy restrictions were not dramatically higher than in laissez-faire places. Draconian lockdowns produced typically plateaus or slow caseload declines, not rapid descent to zero. There are very few relative success stories in the United States. Death rates in Florida, proudly one of the loosest states with its COVID restrictions, hardly any higher than they are in California, self-flagellatingly one of the strictest states. So this Los Angeles Times reporter went to basically every expert. How can this be? How come the results in California are no different from Florida? And I just kept asking these experts over and over and over. The thing I kept hearing from the experts was they don't know. They don't have a good explanation. They kept saying, I don't know. Why, Why was the country's worst autumn surge in COVID, why did it take place in Southern California, a place with about the strictest restrictions? So it's not saying that policy and behavior don't matter, and we don't know. The mitigation measures on which the country is focused the most, such as wearing a mask, social distancing, school closures, restaurant restrictions, perhaps they bent the curve, but they were not firewalls. Many of the factors playing a much larger role in shaping the spread of the COVID pandemic fit much less comfortably in a technocrat's shoulder bag or liberals' scolding moralism. There is the element of chance. There is demography. Demography. Certain demographics seem much more susceptible. You've got a skew of lethality so dramatic that in many of the country's world's youngest countries, there's virtually no death toll. There is the distribution of comorbidities, such as obesity throughout the population. There is geography. Islands enjoy obvious advantages. Communities at higher latitudes are more at risk. There is a country's relationship to its own borders, who its neighbors are, its position in the networks of travel and commerce. There is climate, temperature, humidity. These things shape national outcomes. There is air conditioning. There is the catch-all of cultural forces covering everything from multi-generational living and employment structures to cheek kissing and handshakes. There's residential density, there's blood type, there's vitamin D, there's ICU capacity, there's proximity to bats. At any time you try to put a finger on one single dominant factor, the disease slips away, defying reductive models, suggesting counterpoints and counterfactuals. Japan is old, hardly any COVID. Brazil is largely tropical, devastated by COVID. England is an island, devastated by COVID. There's hardly any air conditioning in France, which was devastated by COVID. So there is a chaos to COVID. It seems random, mysterious. The the spread of the disease has resisted mathematical modeling. The recent collapse in American case numbers came right after the new year, after the country being warned that this would be the pandemic's darkest season. Looking back, you could find just A few lonely voices suggesting winter would be calmer than autumn. CDC modeling has been way off. 24 of the 26 mathematical models said what ended up happening over the first few weeks of 2021 was statistically impossible. The other two models gave it at best a sliver of a chance. So for all the mystery, there is one distinct pattern, national outcomes fall into three obvious clusters. In Europe, North America, and South America, you've got nearly universal failure. In Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, high case loads, low death rates, probably owing to the age structure of populations. In East Asia, Southeast Asia, and Oceania, you've got massive success. So why, however, has Canada outperformed the United States? Why has Uruguay outshone Argentina? Why has Iran suffered so much? Or how has Japan, which never locked down, never tested all that widely, how has Japan succeeded so brilliantly? Now, the differences in outcomes between the groups of nations are far greater than those within them. So much so they appear almost as the burn scars of an entirely different disease. In terms of damage, the coronavirus has not been a Chinese flu. It's been a Western malady. 
take uh, Germany. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Angela Merkel has been celebrated as a beacon of rational leadership. She's a technocrat with a doctorate in quantum chemistry. She's presiding calmly over an unprecedented crisis. She's got a citizenry stereotyped as compliant, orderly, respectful of science. To judge by death rates, Germany has mildly outperformed the United States, but uh, only, only moderately. What happened, though, is that the, the Civil Rights Act was framed in very general terms, um, and it was very strong medicine. It allowed you to basically overturn court verdicts. It allowed you to rewrite the election laws of, of affected states. It allowed you to um, uh, it allowed you to um, overturn what people understood as an under, as 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 being matters of um, of freedom of association. It did it did many things, and it was not in its text limited to race. And so, the application of the civil rights laws began to spread. Um, it covered sex. It covered immigrant status. Um, and so, as time moved on, people began to notice. Um, like, Wait a minute. I don't live in the South, and yet my children are getting bused to schools. Why are kids in Louisville, which is a border South state, and Boston, to take two of the sort of like serious places, why did they have to have their children bused to school? What did that have to do with, with um, Alabama and Mississippi? Um, and so it spread geographically. It spread um, in terms of who was affected. So women who felt their careers thwarted, say, in a, in a corporation, would say, you know, I want to... I think there ought to be more women in positions of um, of authority in this corporation. And people would say, well, it's up to the corporation. And the women would say, well, I think there ought to be a law. And someone would say, well, go go tell the state house and try and pass a law. And the women would say, no, I don't want that. I don't want to get my rights that way by going to the state house and passing a law. I want that same emergency plan to get me the rights now that blacks got in 1964. Because my situation as a woman or as an immigrant, or as a Spanish speaker, or eventually as a disabled person, or a gay person, or a or a transgender person, my situation, they would say, is analogous to that situation that black people were undergoing in the early 60s. Um, and so you had a situation where it was spreading geographically, um, it was spreading in terms of who got affected with it, and finally it was spreading in intensity, okay? So you had, you had much more serious remedies than you had when the legislation was first passed. You had, um, you know, no, in 1964, no one envisioned affirmative action. I mean, there was a word affirmative action, um, but no one no one envisioned it as a, as a source of quotas, you know, let alone the sort of like the talk of equity that we have today. There's really a lot that the government can do um, if you run a business, say, or if you're just going about your business. There's a lot that government can do to you for a lot of different reasons. And so what you had was basically the introduction of this second constitution, as I say, which was authorized in the name of this great moral emergency to overrule the first. And that's why, you know, people would be voting for things and, 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 and they wouldn't happen. You know, you, you know, in, in California, you know, uh, there was a vote to deny benefits to illegal immigrants in the 1990s. I, I, um, you know, regardless of what you think of that vote, it is the way laws are passed in, in the state of California. And it passed, it, it passed by, I think, 5 million votes. Um, yet you had a, you had a judge sort of who, as soon as the, 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 the election started to become law, who said, nope, that you can't do that. One judge in the name of this second constitution. So that generally, I mean, I think that's what you're looking for when you say a thesis. I wouldn't call it a thesis, but it is the style of government. Okay. Here's uh, Ethan Ralph interviewing an ex-porn star. How did you get involved in this in the first place? Like, um, I, I think that this is, a, you know, I, I like to do this with, with every guest, but um, like, what made this like even a thing for you? you know? All right, I'm gonna ask you a question as a rebuttal. So, do you want the the answer that makes you feel good inside? No, I want the real. Or I, do you want the answer that's like the harsh reality of the world? I want the I want the real answer. Yeah. The real answer is I've been sexually assaulted and or harassed the last five jobs and schooling that I have had to the point where I just feel like I was born to be a whore by default and I don't know what else to do with my life. Um, wh wow. When did you really feel like that? Like when, when? Two years old. Really? I was sexually molested. My first childhood memory is molestation. That's... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, you know, and I, 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 I we've had um, guests on the show before, and and people who say, well, you know, all sex workers, all porn stars have been molested, and and they stuff have. Like that. Wow, 
on the psyche. Um, to I want to kill myself. Well. <laughs> How is it on the psyche? Um, to I want to kill myself. Well. <laughs> How is it on the psyche? Um, to I want to kill myself. Man, I really okay, would. Why? why? Because why? I would yeah. I would rather be angry and murder people. If I was a man, well, I no. probably would go into the military. I probably would fucking fight. But the thing is, I have a vagina and I have been oppressed my entire life. No. And I, men, I think and men, and men will never care. They laugh. They lever, they always this, laugh at women's rights. They always well, do. Well, this is why because you talk about oppression by men and then you you justify becoming a porn star because you were oh, oppressed by men. Like you won't, you won't own that, like what's, your own choices and stuff. What, what's your first childhood memory? Riding a tricycle. Yeah. Fuck you. Mine was getting raped and making child pornography. You piece of shit. Okay. I'd rather be a man. I really okay, would. Why? Why? We were hit with a, with a cri a global crisis. We failed. <laughs> And that's what I learned. I learned what do you think that about COVID? Would, how's it been I, for you? How about how, I, how's it been for you? And then how do you think it's been for everybody else? I mean, I got COVID. Oh, so. I got COVID on Thanksgiving, and I was a super spreader on accident. Ah. On accident. Ah. On accident. Ah. <laughs> Regardless of my of my public health knowledge, yeah, I'm you are. A super I, spreader. I was a super <laughs> spreader. <laughs> when we were. Wow, this woman is just uh, extraordinarily frank. I, I want to hear more of what she has to say. Come on, man. Now, I think that was something that I had playing in the background. What in the fuck was that? Hey, I'm a, I'm a first guest, so... <laughs> We gotta, we gotta work it first out. First live in studio guest. Yeah. Okay, you know what? I'm, I'm saying I'm loud as fuck. I'm the first to sit at this desk. That's true. That's true. To have a an in studio guest, you are the first. I don't know why we can't hear Gator at all. It's kind of weird. Did we not? We just talked to him right before the you show. You can't. You can't. But the chat can. Chat. Anyway, <laughs> the whole setup over there is new. <laughs> um. So I'm originally from California, born and raised Californian. Um, I was an academic before doing porn. Actually. Wait. 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 Okay, what kind of, uh, what, what part of the academy were you? Uh, I, well, ironically, pre-COVID, public health. Really? Um, I actually have a bachelor's of arts in public health, not bachelor's of science. And um, I was really discouraged by what I learned in my degree program while I was going to school for public health. And I decided to pursue adult work per an instructor's advice instead of going into a master's program for public health. <laughs> now, wait, first off, there's a couple things you have to break down here. First off, <laughs> first off what, what made you disillusioned in the first place? Um, the entire first couple of semesters in public health with female instructors brought to light mostly female health issues. And I was essentially instructed that it would be more profitable to do adult work than it would be to pursue anything in the public health sphere. Now, I mean... <laughs> And then when we saw what happened with the global pandemic, it was basically true. Um, we were not prepared for a global pandemic, and that's what I learned about while studying in school, and I gave up on my public health dreams. <laughs> so yeah, so I was actually instructed, <laughs> I was instructed while in school to just do porn. I'm not even. Yeah, why did your professors instruct <laughs> no, wait, you wait, wait. to uh, yeah, to do porn? I was saying he raised a good question. Was it your professors or was it like? No, my actual instructors <laughs> told me that I would be better off doing porn than I would be oh. to do anything in public health because there's no hope for humanity. <laughs> <laughs> wow! And, you know that, what? and that's what we saw. We really did see that when we were hit with a with a, cri a global crisis, we failed. <laughs> and that's what I learned. I learned what do you think that about COVID? Would, how's it been I, for you? How about how, how's it been for you? And then how do you think it's been for everybody? Else? I mean, I got COVID. Oh, sure. I got COVID on Thanksgiving. And I was a super spreader on, ac ah, on accident, ah. on accident, <laughs> regardless of my, of my public health knowledge. Yeah, I, was you are super I, I was a super spreader. <laughs> I, how sick did you get when you got I, I was a super spreader. I got sick on, uh, I know because it's funny, but <laughs> yeah, I'm a poor star. That, yeah. They're like, yeah, you're a super spreader. <laughs> but I, so a family member was shopping at uh, an Aldi's grocery store and they were infected and unbeknownst to us, it was spread on Thanksgiving dinner. I got the virus on Thanksgiving.